Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to each one of you attending this live webinar from various parts of the world. My name is Ruben, and on behalf of Team Dentist Channel dot online, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker for this live webinar. Dr. Sohil completed his post graduation in prosthodontics, TMD, and implant dentistry concurrently with a Master of Science degree in Oral Biology from the University of Medicine and Dentistry, New Jersey Dental School, United States of America. He completed his PhD from the Annamalai University, RM Dental College and Hospital, India. He is the founder of Implant Dentistry Study Consortium, the first American Dental Association approved dental implant continuing education course in the Gulf and Middle East which is also affiliated to the Society of International Congress of Oral Implantologists and the University of Toronto. He is the chairman of the scientific committee, Implant Dentistry Consensus, United Arab Emirates. It's so very privileged to have you, Dr. Sohail. Without much further ado, I now request you to kindly continue with the live webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. The photographs you see in front of you, uh, I'm sure at least few of these people have affected your life uh, positively. And the question is, were you ready at that time when they gave their message to be affected by them positively or not? Now, the topic of today, similarly, is giving you a message. And the message is predictable aesthetics after uh, 10,000 implant cases. And the question is, are you ready to benefit from this presentation and practice it in your daily um, implantology uh, practice? We start with an introduction. We go to some guidelines. We analyze the concept of predictability and the concept of borders. And then we proceed till we can up to say 45 to 50 minutes. After that, we will pause and have the discussion and the question and answer. The concept of predictable aesthetics has a lot of rules and regulations because you want predictability at the end of the day. One of the main marriages that requires to be always kept in mind is the space and restoration. These two have to be understood, not only biologically, but also mechanically. So imagine an area which is constructed. I'm sure if you look at this design, you will find some flaws which you do not like, which you think maybe the light should have come from this angle or that angle. The same thing when we discuss about the ABC guidelines and predictable aesthetics, you will always have a case which will not be applied to these rules and regulations. But generally, the rules which we are discussing is uh, applicable to all the cases. And we are not changing any of the existing rules and regulation. We are adding to the existing uh, principles which is already being published in different articles. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I have made them into an ABC. A is talking about available and missing tooth, bone, and soft tissue. A itself, if you look at it, it's availability and missing. That's two uh, points. Teeth, bone, and soft tissue itself is three. If you multiply them, you have six options when it comes to available and missing tooth, bone, and soft tissue. This is, if you look at it two-dimensionally, but if you look at it three-dimensionally, you have so many options when you're analyzing the available and missing teeth, bone, and soft tissue, because we are not fabricating uh, an object like a carpenter, which can only be there uh, without a biological interference of the cells. That's why A itself, if we can complete the A uh, today, uh, it will be bringing at least six aspects 
that each of them has to be uh, explained. The second point is uh, very uh, simple to understand, which is the interproximal bone, which is available between the tooth and the implant. And that small amount, one or two millimeter of sharp bone, which is right against the tooth, that is definitely a very, very necessity for predictable aesthetics. And if it's not available, of course, uh, the surgical procedure should be modified and that area should not be uh, manipulated and no incision should be placed on that area. If that bony margin is not there against the neighboring tooth where the implant will be placed next to it. The third one is a very easy to understand. If there is a lip coverage and the aesthetic is not, um, the patient has no high lip line, definitely you can uh, be uh, easier for you to predict the aesthetics for that group of patients. So basically, A, kind of takes the maximum amount of discussion compared to B and C. Now, many of you uh, know about the pi, and some of you even try to remember the number. What is so special about the pi? Because it's the diameter of the, the ratio between the diameter and the circumference of a circle, because it's an irrational number. What are the other irrational things we have? Say, for example, if you, um, if you have, uh, if you want to look at aesthetics, because we don't have a straight, perfect square, and whenever any shape is not a perfect square, is considered irrational. That's why one of the other irrational numbers that we have is the golden proportion because of that irrational geometry that we have to create to be able to call it aesthetics. Now, if you, look, if you show this photograph to a, a, a carpenter or a layman, uh, for them, this is a missing square and it's very easy to duplicate a square. But we know how difficult it's to replace a central incisor. And that's why we have this session. Uh, the reason is the difference between the way we look at central incisors and a carpenter, which they look at it as a square or as a rectangular. We look at this as a concept of clopin. If you're not used to this terminology, it's a very interesting terminology to learn. Clopin is something between open and closed. That means some of the borders or guidelines or uh, circumference are already set for you. That means you have no choice but to abide by those margins. And then you have an open margin, which you don't know where it should be placed to fabricate the restoration. So the boundaries you have, some of them are dictated upon you and some of them are open. You have to decide where those boundaries should be. And that's a very difficult scenario when you're dealing with aesthetics. Now, all of us are familiar with celebrities and we are all happy to see them smile. We go to their movies, but a small um, area of uh, changing the white aesthetics or not knowing where is this missing tooth, especially in the anterior area, that will definitely suddenly create an unacceptable uh, aesthetics. Now, let us be realistic. Rarely we can see people who do not smoke and at the same time, they have enough amount of bone. And at the same time, financially, they are comfortable enough to tell you, go ahead. Uh, financially, there is no limitation. So now in this world where we do not have all the three together, we have to 
think of what's the best way to create predictable aesthetics. Due to the fact that as the age of the patient goes by and the etiology where caused them to receive this kind of edentulism is being accompanied by some habits or financial reasons that cause the bone to resorb. Now, what are the solutions when the patient show up and they do not have these uh, uh, three things or one of the three? One of the solutions, we tend to go to a smaller diameter implants with a higher success rate than we used to think about them because uh, as we know, there are many types of implants that give you a uh, narrow uh, diameter. However, we all know all of them do not behave sim similarly because biomechanically, if some of these uh, implants have a very thin wall and they compromised on the biomechanics of the wall, then definitely it has uh, uh, some problems for us to be able to uh, restore them. So not all the implants which are narrow diameter, they give you the same successful results. So you should be aware which system to use when you're using a narrow diameter implant. The second thing we do is when we don't have the bone money or the patient is smoking, we do something called osteotomy with expansion, whether it's manual, whether it's uh, with different techniques, or we use piezo surgery to split the bone and to be able to uh, provide the implant with sufficient amount of buccal and lingual bone, or we do something called osteocondensation. So basically, we try to modify the shape of the bone for it to be receiving the implant. And the third and the mostly uh, a published topic, I think, is augmentation. We tend to do a bone augmentation. We have many, many techniques in creating sufficient um, uh, vertical and horizontal dimension in bone to be able to place those implants. Now, putting those three steps in front of us to be able to get closer to re uh, predictable aesthetics, also, there is another uh, marriage, which is a marriage of time and reference. We should respect time when it comes to biological procedures. Even in, in um, carpentry and uh, uh, engineering, for example, if you have a building which has to be poured with a specific type of cement, the entire building, you have to 24 seven, be able to supply that cement in a proper um, consistency during the day and the night, keeping the temperature the same for you to receive the same amount of um, quality of the cement, even if it takes seven days or 10 days. So even in that aspect, you have to worry about uh, time. Now imagine you're talking about an oral cavity with uh, more than uh, uh, millions of bacteria that you have to always keep in mind that this restoration should last for at least 10 to 20 years. So for that time and reference, where do you refer this scheduling of time to be able to provide the predictable aesthetics is also very important. When you look at the procedures of the surgery, even though we are not going into detail of each of them, but if you can respect the time and the space and the reference for placing an implant by dividing it into different steps. Here, I divided the surgery into 12 steps, and I think each of them contribute uh, to the predictable aesthetics. And each of them by themselves are very important if it's con considered separately to be able to receive a better uh, prognosis. Now, uh, sometimes we look at some of these steps and say it's a very straightforward, uh, but each of them can 
very much if it's studied and if you understand the, the complications when you do, don't do them right, you can definitely uh, have adverse effects. Now, time in, in doing those steps are definitely very important. For example, I have placed an implant in seven minutes, which I'm not very proud of. And I have taken 60 minutes to place a single implant, which I'm not very ashamed of. The home tech message from this slide is, it doesn't matter if you are quick or you're slow. If you do all the steps respectfully in the time that it requires, you will definitely be closer to a predictable aesthetics. Now, an average of 10,000 cases that we have done between us and different doctors, we found uh, something close to 26 minutes is what's average for um, placing a single implant from A to Z, respecting all aesthetic uh, uh, steps and concerns during the procedure. Now, let us see why these steps are so important. Even though it's called evaluation, but at the time of evaluation, the size of the implant plays a major role in aesthetics. When you provide anesthesia, the quantity and the location of the anesthesia will make the patient more comfortable and more cooperative for the entire procedure. An incision is just an irreversible uh, procedure where if you are not placing it at the right place at the time of suturing it, you will have very difficult time and it affects your healing in a very negative way, especially if it's in the aesthetic zone. When you elevate the flap, it's very handy to have your assistant aware how to keep that soft tissue while you're proceeding further if you're doing a, a full mouth or a very delicate soft tissue versus you and the suction are trying to uh, battle with positioning of your flap. Uh, to me, template is visualization. If your template can visualize the final prosthesis at all times, then that's the template that I need to have. So visualization of the bone, visualization of the soft tissue, visualization of the final prosthesis at the time of surgery is really needed after you elevate the soft tissue. This is a, a point of no return, which I called uh, mark your spot. Once you start the osteotomy, even though you always can think that you can modify the osteotomy, but the best osteotomy if it's placed in the right spot. So to me, that is one of the most important steps in predictable aesthetics is where you mark your spot to start osteotomy. When it comes to radiography, peripical radiography during the procedure, uh, because the patient is lying down and as perpendicular as possible, if you can get those views, you can know exactly where you are and how uh, can you modify the position of your drills or how can you uh, modify your uh, plan. And this radiography at this time, again, we're going to time, space, and reference uh, is definitely, uh, I think it's very helpful not to proceed with a small mistake because you are not knowing where you are and you don't have a radiographical uh, reference. When it comes to angulation, of course, the best instrument is a side cutting instrument. Linderman has been very, very useful, and I don't think it has uh, any alternative. Now, one of the most expensive choices that you can do in, uh, in implantology practice is the ninth step, is when you t decide to open an implant and use it. And if you made the wrong choice, you made uh, an expensive choice. It comes the placement, 
I think the key to the placement is not the position only. It's not the uh, primary stability only. It's where you know the restoration is going to be. But primary stability, I mean, when I say where you know is where it's related to the final prosthesis, which is predictable. But for, for you to be able to achieve that, and predictably have that final prosthesis in that position, you should be skillful enough to know how to gain primary stability in the aesthetic zone. Scoring to me is destroying the vascularization, but sometimes it's required because you need to do augmentation. So the less you damage the periosteum for you to be able to do the scoring, the better the uh, predictable aesthetics and of course suturing even though it's the 12th step is the last step but it's not less important than any of the other 11 steps if not more uh, of some of the other steps now let us uh, talk in detail that was the introduction let us talk about the a which is available and missing tooth bone and soft tissue after talking about time, now we need to, to talk about space and restoration. And we need to understand the borders and dimensions in the aesthetic area. Just to uh, emphasize on how important is this borders and dimensions and aesthetic zone, we, even in the real life, we have divided the world into boundaries and we call them borders. In 1925, there was a law that even for the borders, each country for a, a, an amount of six meters, they are not allowed to touch that border. So for six meters between every border and the next country, unless the both countries uh, agree upon, uh, I know in some European countries, they don't have a very clear borders in some areas, but internationally, it's very acceptable for six meters, you shouldn't build anything there. That means three meters on each side, which this number three, actually, it's very much referred to even implant dentistry. When you place two implants, you should not have uh, a procedure or some material between that two implants for a distance of three millimeters. So my point is boundaries and borders are very important. In many textbooks, I need to remove this so you can see. Yeah. In, uh, in many um, articles or textbooks, there are different numbers which have been published to be the ideal space between teeth and the implant or between two implants and what's the ideal buckle bone. Uh, it's very interesting that in this photo, none of these numbers are accurate. And that's why I put this photograph, just because it's a photograph in a textbook that doesn't mean the author is actually mentioning the correct dimensions. And I wanted you to know what is the most acceptable dimensions which we abide by when it comes to borders uh, between implants and teeth. In 2004, Gastaldo was uh, uh, the one with, of course, his team and many others have referred to this article, um, including Dennis Tarno and others, that the best amount of space between a tooth and an implant to have a papilla is 1.5 millimeters. And the best distance between two implants is three millimeters. Uh, the second border that we are keeping in mind is what Boozer told us, that the ideal uh, number of uh, millimeters of bone to be buccally placed is two millimeters and lingually as well. And anything less than 1.8 millimeter will have um, uh, possibility of resorption on a long run. Khan in 2003, he spoke about the predictable soft tissue aesthetics 
and he said if you have a thick something close to two millimeter of keratinized uh, tissue on top of the implant on top of the bone you have less chance of um, soft tissue recession and bone resorption underneath so these numbers come from these three people now so if i have a 1.5 millimeter as a reference or a border between my implant and i have a four millimeter in between so a seven millimeter uh, zone is what I want for predictable uh, aesthetics to receive the papilla. I need two millimeter of soft tissue buccally, two millimeter of bone buccally. Say, imagine four millimeter diameter implant, and then two millimeter of bone lingually, and two millimeter of soft tissue lingually, which gives us around 12 millimeter. Now, we all know to have a 12 millimeter. Uh, buccolingual width in today's practice is rarely seen. So is there a shortcut for these numbers or there is a way? What is the minimum way to be still have predictable aesthetics based on those um, three authors and the literature is when we are talking about the two millimeter of soft tissue and two millimeter of bone with what Boozer is talking about, there is also an understanding that if one of these two are only one millimeter, one of them, buccally and lingually, still you can have predictable aesthetics. What do I mean by that? If, the, if you have a two millimeter of soft tissue, but you have one millimeter of bone, still the area is predictable. And if you have two millimeter of bone and one millimeter of soft tissue and you don't have a thick biotype, still the area is predictable. So that gives you a two millimeter savior from the 12 millimeter rule. That means 10 millimeter. Now, if the diameter of the implant is 3.5 millimeter onward, still you have the same success rate as of a standard size implant. So that gives you another half a millimeter from the implant. So 9.5 millimeter width happens to be the, the least number that you can have predictable aesthetics with that. It's easy to see that on a simple alginate port cast to see this 9.5 millimeter. If you look at the CBCT, you're looking at the bone, not always you can see the soft tissue clearly on the CBCT. So actually your simple cast, which is taken from the patient, a simple alginate study model is one of the best ways on the first visit to be able to see if you have the 9.5 millimeter or not. Of course, if you have more, the predictability is higher. Now, I want to talk about more borders, more dimensions, which are really essential and predictable aesthetics. Even though this is not an ideal um, schematic photograph, but it definitely clarifies the good things and the wrong things that we could or we should avoid doing when we are doing a single central incisor uh, case. Now, let us start from the, the neck of the implant. If the neck of the implant is smooth and the threads are not all the way to the tip, we know the bone will have a tendency to travel all the way to the first thread. So using an implant which has a smooth neck or even machine neck in the aesthetic zone is not something predictable. Now. With the Boozer Stroman implant in the early days where they had a soft tissue level, it's only predictable if you have two millimeter. That's why actually Boozer published that article. If you have two millimeter of bone and two millimeter of soft tissue, yes, you can have predictable aesthetics. And so you can have a, a machine surface soft, uh, non-threaded uh, neck of the implant where they recommended to place it 
uh, infra bony level. But if you want to have a predictable uh, implant, the threads should go all the way to the implant uh, platform surface. The second area is where you place the implant in relation to the bone. If you're going half a millimeter lower or 0.75, according to different systems, that should be sufficient enough if you are using a platform switch implant. And if you are doing a, a laser treated neck, uh, probably you can stay at the bone level and you do not have to submerge the implant. But in uh, the platform switch concept, it is recommended to give a 0.5 to 0.75 millimeter below the bone level, the, where the implant should be placed. Now, this should match the other border or the other law or the other principle, which is three millimeter below the CEJ of the future crown and the neighboring uh, crowns or the neighboring natural dentition. They, they should coincide. So hopefully, if the bone is too much, you'll be shaving it. And if the bone is too little, you'll be building it. The next uh, guideline or the next border or the next dimension is how you treat the abutment part, which is under the soft tissue. The abutment, which is connected to the implant, if it can be concave all around 360 degrees, that allows the soft tissue to actually become thicker and become uh, the two millimeter. So concavity of the abutment generally is not prefabricated. So if you are modifying the stock abutments, that's fine. And if you're doing uh, custom made abutments, you should keep in mind to make the concavity for the soft tissue to become thicker is definitely advisable. The next um, um, border is where the gingiva is there. And this thickness is the key for your success. So when you know the position of the gingiva, you can also decide where the ceramic should end. Generally, what the laboratories do because of the history of crown and bridge, they kind of place the ceramic all the way to the margin of the crown. This is a practice taken or carried on from uh, um, crown and bridge to implantology. This you have to really intervene and you have to inform your technician that that's not implant dentistry practice. In implant dentistry practice, the soft tissue is where the ceramic ends in the non-aesthetic area and on the buccal area, probably um, half to one millimeter below the uh, margin of the uh, gingiva. So gingiva is what decides where the ceramic should end. And this X is of course, what the labs, they like to do, they like to make it as aesthetic and bulky, and we should avoid this kind of a design. So labially to uh, uh, kind of block the grayness of the uh, abutment, uh, there is uh, enough um, canulo and different articles about how to use ceramic abutments, which is, um, definitely very friendly to the soft tissue. However, with the success rate of uh, ceramics in, uh, in the abutment, we are still reluctant to use ceramic abutments with the, where the base is not metal. The, the top part can be metal, but that doesn't solve the problem of the uh, grainish because this part will always be in metal. No matter what, Placing the ceramic half a millimeter to one millimeter below the gingiva in the aesthetic area will also have a nice uh, aesthetic look when the patient is smiling or he or she is in the light. The next point is the contact point where we can have a contact point, contact area, and a, 
a flat uh, contact area. So this is very important, as Dr. Dennis Tarno explained uh, very well, uh, that where should this contact be if you want to preserve the papilla? And we know if the bone level is here, you measure five millimeter or your lab, or you create that in your provisional restoration where the lab will calculate, sorry, five millimeter from the bony margin. And that's where, or imagine if it's here, that five millimeter is where the contact will start. And that's how the contact will be. The concavity here uh, is very crucial if you're doing a screw retained restoration, which that's what we like to do. Unfortunately, in the aesthetic zone, it's not always possible to do um, screw retained restoration. It's much easier to do them in the posterior teeth or the anterior mandible. However, in the maxillary dentition, screw retained still is a challenge. Um, but this is a definitely an important area where um, how the occlusion is going to contact this restoration. And of course, the tip of your restoration in terms of aesthetics, in terms of um, how the lab is actually uh, making the marriage of different colors and translucencies to give you something natural that is also uh, very, very important. So those uh, four uh, items that we need to focus is the, the thickness of the soft tissue, the missing and the available, the missing and the available bone, the dimension of the implant, and the dimension of the restoration. Now, when I say missing and available, if you don't have it, you have to create it. So basically, that's what I mean by missing. And if you have the two millimeter of bone, fantastic. But you have to acknowledge how much bone you have. And if you don't have this two millimeter of bone, you have to think of uh, providing it. And you have to decide what time and when and how. The same thing with the soft tissue. Normally, uh, soft tissue augmentation is more predictable when it's done prior to the surgery, not during the surgery. So the timing of the missing and available is important. The, the missing and the available also is related to the diameter of the implant. It's also related to the shape of the uh, final restoration or the final crown. So measuring everything when it comes to precision in predictable aesthetics is one of the key factors. And once you have a measurement three-dimensionally of the missing soft tissue and you know where the bone is going to be, whether it's in a model, whether it's on a CBCT, whether it's on a, any um, uh, an analog model, you can then plan all your dimensions in a more predictable fashion. So if you say shave um, the thickness of the soft tissue from your cast model, even though this is a very primitive way, but you can, because you did the bone sounding uh, in the mouth, you can know approximately what is the amount of bone the number two that you have, and you can know what should be the diameter of the implant accordingly by keeping the 1.5 millimeter, and you can then decide how the crown should be fabricated where you respect all the laws of keeping the uh, papilla in place. So basically these four items are necessary for you to understand the gingival thickness, bone thickness, implant thickness or diameter, and the tooth thickness or the tooth shape. Now, when we talk about the soft tissue thickness, we're talking about ideally two millimeter. 
the bone ideally again two millimeter the diameter of the implant should respect the surrounding spaces what does that mean it means uh, where should the implant be in relation to the bone and where the implant should be in relation to the neighboring teeth and of course the shape of the restoration which is related also to the surrounding teeth and soft tissue now uh, let's see who said these four things and in history how we can understand when was all these decisions made and how we are benefiting and who are the people behind these theories that we are following today this is an interesting uh, um, evolution that uh, I was fascinated with all these uh, researchers. I had to make this because to me, they are very respectful. And for me to understand where we are and whom we should contribute and whose articles we should read to know how did it start, um, I put this together. We're not going to talk about all of them. We're going, just talking about these four people who spoke about these four elements. In 1992, um, Dennis Tarno, he spoke about the position of the papilla in relation to the bone. Then in 2003, Khan, he spoke about the thickness of the biotype is relevant to the bone resorption in the knees. And in 2004, two uh, authors, one is uh, Boozer, who spoke about the importance of the two millimeter of buccal bone rule. And Gastaldo, who spoke about the 1.5 millimeter between the tooth and the implant and three millimeter between the two implants. So basically, there is enough literature beside the four people that I mentioned, which support the importance of these numbers when it comes to predictable aesthetics. Now, let us see uh, how can we clinically uh, understand this concept. So when we are having um, a CBCT, this is a schematic diagram for us to, be under, uh, to, uh, to understand also the soft tissue. With the CBCT here, it's not very easy to predict the thickness of the soft tissue. So imagine we have um, a schematic diagram and the CBCT of that area that we, want, we are concerned with. If you want to have the two millimeter where you did your uh, calculation and you want to have two millimeter of bone, generally you have to be very careful how to treat this bone if you don't have that available uh, quantity that you want and how to treat the soft tissue from the time that you give the anesthesia to keep that soft tissue in this thickness and if you don't have it how you want to predictably uh, create it once you understand this concept a bigger problem comes to your uh, uh, for you to solve the dimension again we mentioned about the term clopen which is closed and open closed in uh, areas that you cannot touch and open in areas that uh, you have to restore it comes to the dimension of the missing teeth. Of course, I made this to scare you because if you have 11 millimeter of space between the central and the lateral and your implant is say four millimeter or say 3.7 or 3.8, all of them um, are considered regular size implants, then your 1.5 millimeter law is broken. Thank God, central incisors are generally not 11 millimeter in width they're approximately 8.5 but even with an 8.5 if you do not have sufficient bone to place a four millimeter implant you are violating the principles that is ideal so most of the time the restoration is the key factor where all these numbers should fall in place. So the first thing you want to do is to create a wax up of the mesodistal width 
and the height of your final restoration. And putting all these numbers that we discussed back up, knowing those numbers, and then doing this measurement will definitely land up in you expecting your predictable aesthetics or not, and how can you modify it. So again, it goes back to the final restoration. This is a very interesting uh, uh, article by Khan, again, uh, where he classified where generally the teeth are and which one of them is predictably you can place an implant at the time of extraction. Um, uh, in class one, of course, it's the most, um, uh, he, he, uh, he's happy that most of the cases actually are like this. I'm not very sure in all of our practice we agree or not. The point is he classified something predictable. These two are less predictable and needs a procedure. And this one is definitely, it's no go and it's not recommended. And these are the numbers in terms of uh, a percentage, how much of this uh, scenario you will see. So the most scenario that he saw in his article was this, but for him, uh, for me, the, the part which was interesting is what he recommended for each was the interesting part, not to classify, because maybe in uh, a population in Dubai, which 80% uh, of the population are actually foreigners, we cannot have a consistent um, result where, in, say, in a Sweden, where 99% of the population are the same uh, from the same place. So. For, for me, the, the percentage of the population probably is not applicable to my practice. But what's recommended by him is applicable to my practice, which he says, if you have a scenario like this, your chances of success is much higher because you will use this bone and you can place some bone between the, the existing host bone and your implant. And as you go between two and three, class two and three, you have to be, it's a technique sensitive. You have to do additional attention to be able to decide what to do or not. And of course he contradicts uh, totally to do any procedure unless you do a block graph or do a, um, so basically he says, this is your best scenario. So if you see this in your CBCT, um, it's a green line to, to have predictable aesthetics. Now, let us come out of that Kahn's classification and let us look at an arbitrary um, drawing, which I made. If you look at the borders and layers that we discussed, these, the bone level in all the cases are almost the same. So the, the, the soft tissue and the bone is the same. Now, what is the change that happened here is the A, which is the, the decision of the dentist to understand the available and missing bone soft tissue and the tooth, which he had to create. And based on that, this is the, this is the basically the cream of the crop. What I'm gonna say now, if you haven't heard any of what I said, this is, this is the take home, the real take home message. Based on the available and missing bone, soft tissue and tooth, the diameter, length and position of the implant is the key to predictable aesthetics. So I will try to repeat that. So the available and missing teeth, bone, and soft tissue whatever dimensions based on that you get to decide on the position, the diameter, the length of the implant is what will create 
predictable aesthetics. So when you know these numbers is not enough. It's just a tool to get to the goal. What is the goal? The goal is to have all these tools, which is knowing the available and missing tooth, bone, and soft tissue, and then decide on the diameter, length, position of your implant. Now, all of these three, uh, soft tissue and bone, are the same, almost same, but the diameter, length, and position of the implants have caused the restoration to be different. So the position of your implant not only contributes to the predictability of the maintenance of the bone itself and the soft tissue itself, also it causes the position of the restoration. So all this elements after you diagnosed the available and missing teeth the available and missing bone the available and missing soft tissue and you decided on the diameter length and position of your implant then you have to create the restoration with an understanding of how to have predictable aesthetics. That's why this is an irrational geometry because there are nothing in a perfect square in all of what I said. And that's why it remains um, very difficult to uh, understand. So let us just summarize what I meant by this. If you are planning to have a screw retained restoration, you will have in many times to be able to um, predict, to have predictable bone, you have to do a little bit of augmentation here. And everything else will follow into place. And the diameter of the implant is not um, four definitely, it's something close to 3.3 .3 or 3.5 but we use the longer one to compensate for the diameter. Here, it was definitely the fastest way we can put an implant, which is where the bone is, put it in the center, and let's worry about it later. And then, of course, you know, you will have a huge angulation difference. You need an angulated abutment. When you have an angulated abutment, this corner is always... Um, going to give you a reflection of the gray area and you will always have a ridge lap with the restoration and you, because you have to copy the neighboring teeth you will have a weak connection between your restoration and the implant why because you have to make this cementable you have to use an angulated abutment and you have a ledge here where you will not have uh, enough thickness of ceramic and you don't have a very aesthetic result. But during the surgery, you had the best time because it took you seven minutes or 10 minutes and you're so proud that you did the surgery in less time than anybody else in the neighborhood. Here is another scenario where you use the standard size implant you still have to do a little bit of augmentation and it was you didn't really need a lot of time to um, spend to be able to um, uh, make this into a screw retained this is definitely much easier to practice than a and it will give you an aesthetic result but you have to compromise the cement uh, versus screw retained and still you have to do a little bit of augmentation. So to me, this is um, a shortcut where many of us do in aesthetic dentistry today, B, and people who are more experienced, they go to C, 
because it's easier. And people who are really, really picky and they think 10, 20, 30 years from today, what will happen to my patient? How I'm going to maintain them? How I'm going to have predictable aesthetics? They go to the A category. These numbers and these lines and these borders are definitely available to us. There are enough authors. Um, Carl Misch textbook till today, I think uh, a lot of things in that textbook is applicable uh, up to today. And we should keep in mind, even though at that time, most of the restorations were cementable and a lot of his theories are uncementable. But once you... Um, uh, skip that part where it talks about the clearance of the occlusal table for the ceramic because he was doing cementable in most of his presentations. If you look at other numbers, everything is still remains the same. And what we discussed earlier is very much clear where the implant should be, if it's at the bone level or if it's half a millimeter below the bone level, where the implant should have a concave, even I think even more than this, and the ceramic should just go um, half a millimeter to one millimeter below the soft tissue. And what's the minimum height you want if you're doing cementable, for example, say for the anterior reason. And all these uh, numbers are very good in helping you to decide how to do the A, which is how to calculate the missing and available uh, soft tissue, hard tissue, and tooth. Why these numbers are so important? If you are having a chair at the lounge and you're sitting and relaxing, the dimensions of the height of that chair in relation to your leg or the, or the stands of that chair is based on some principles. You don't use the same chair if you're sitting uh, on a table to have breakfast or coffee or read. For that, you need a different dimension. Even for the table, for you to put your hand on top of it, you need a, a, a specific height to be able to be comfortable. So for me, when you look at objects, the reason that they have a dimension, why a table tennis is in that size, why the Milky Way galaxy is in that size, why the virus now we are all talking about this virus, why the virus is in this size, why the bacteria, why the hair dimension is in this size. All of these are because every dimension. Okay, I wanted first to say in natural objects, but later I even decided on artificial objects even to, to make it a, a very general statement. The reason why they have that dimension is because they want to sustain in that thing that they do. So that dimension gives them the right and the chance to be able to sustain. And once you change their dimension, they don't sustain as much as they should. That's why we should respect these dimensions and these numbers. Now, gingival thickness, uh, I... Uh, I treated these two girls, they both, the interesting thing about these two cases is they both of them wanted to do implant so they can get married. So this was a, this was a case that um, the, 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 the future uh, uh, bridegroom has not seen the girl yet. Uh, it's just a photograph back and forth. The father of the girl is concerned. What if you know, the boy sees the, my girl and they don't have teeth and the marriage doesn't take place. So it puts me in a very, very sensitive and very important uh, uh, responsible job to be able to have a predictable aesthetics and give those two young girls an aesthetic that they can comfortably go and, you know, basically get married and continue their life. Now, you can easily see the predictability of the top case versus the lower case, where I have the uh, 12 millimeter and when I don't have the 12 millimeter. 
And when I say the available and missing, there is even available uh, freedom, which is definitely not helping the, the longevity of the position of the soft tissue, the concavity, the missing bone. Uh, obviously, in this case, we cannot have predictable aesthetics and augmentation uh, definitely is required, even though the diameter of the implants are the same, but we can both agree that those numbers, if they were applied and they were done, we could achieve uh, successful results as good as this if those dimensions were there. And the reason I maintain both of these uh, girls uh, after 18 years, I still maintain them, but definitely, aesthetically, we have much better results with this case versus this case. And the reason is the available soft tissue thickness uh, is, uh, and the available bone underneath is definitely causing the predictability of these cases after 18 years to be, so that's, that's the reason why I can say what I'm saying is based on not doing all those principles and not allowing the two millimeter of bone and the soft tissue on top, this is the reason why we are not having predictable aesthetics. And just because in this case we had them, uh, we have predictable aesthetics. And by knowing those numbers, and if we don't have them, we create those numbers, the two millimeter and the two millimeter, and then decide on the diameter length and the position of the implant, we can have predictable aesthetics. Now, Khan has shown us this very clearly, that if we um, have those uh, uh, thickness in the gingiva, definitely it's more predictable uh, results and the bone underneath will not resorb. And he basically emphasized on the biotype. We are all familiar and we don't need convincing that if you can create a thick biotype, you will have better results. So pay attention to measuring the biotype. Uh, the, the simple way to measure it is just to place um, um, a perioprobe underneath the gingiva in the sulcus. And if you can see the grayness of the probe, that means it's a thin biotype. And if you cannot see it, it's thick biotype. If you want to look into measurement, Mechanical measurement, uh, two millimeter is definitely a thick biotype and anything less than one millimeter and less is considered thin biotype. Now, what he shows in his uh, in article that there is a slight difference between the, poc the probing depth of uh, tooth and implant. In implant, you have more uh, than teeth. So, uh, uh, the minimum you have is 3.6, which is for teeth, and the maximum you have is 6.3, which is an implant. So there is definitely a, a difference in the pocket depth. Almost, almost uh, the minimum of this and the maximum of that is twice. And if you look at the, the standard deviation, uh, 0.6 to 1.2 is the error or the chances of more or less between them. So the moral of the story he here is, since you know you have a deeper pocket in implants, so paying attention to not placing the implant as deep as you can to have predictable aesthetics is better to keep it at the bone level or maximum at 0.75 below the bone level, and then do the other architectural engineering around that versus just keep placing the implant deeper and deeper and then uh, try to um, uh, create a crown which is not visible uh, at the gingival margin. This is just to show you the difference between teeth uh, probing depth and implants. So by knowing that when you have a thick biotype, we will have less chance of bone resorption. So 
if you have a thick biotag, even if your bone thickness is not two millimeter, you can predictably have the same amount of aesthetics and longevity of its prognosis for many, many years if you can create the thick biotype if you don't have it. So uh, I will read this because it's very important. Implants with a buccal shoulder position showed three times more recession than implants with the lingual shoulder position, with the difference being highly statistically significant. What does that mean? First of all, we discussed that since we know the bone will all the way go to the first thread, this shoulder should not be at the bone level. So your bone should be somewhere here at the time of placement. If you're doing so, why do you even need this? Because this will make less room for the soft tissue. So this design totally is not meant for aesthetics. Maybe for an overdenture, maybe for uh, non-aesthetic areas, but for an aesthetic area, the implant should be straight line and you should not have a shoulder. And as soon as the abutment starts, you want to give a concavity at the borders of the abutment as we discussed earlier. Now here uh, is an interesting study. Um, uh, I don't know if it's published or not. I was listening to the author and she shared this photo with me. Uh, it's very interesting that the buccal bone seems to be more uh, important uh, than the lingual bone in terms of aesthetics. So the two millimeter bone around the implant is more significant in terms of uh, aesthetics if it is two millimeter buccally not as significant and the bone remodeling will not happen the same way it happens on the buccal bone so buccal bone bone remodeling and lingual bone bone remodeling is not equally same. So if you have a choice of placing the implant slightly palatal versus in the center, I would recommend based on this research to place it slightly palatal because the way the bone remodeling occurs on the buccal bone and the resorption follows doesn't happen on the palatal bone. So for us, it's very clear now. We know uh, prosthetically, because you want to do a screw retained restoration, we would like to place the implants always slightly palatal. However, that even bone remodeling is different. For me, it was not um, something published. So after this, I'm convinced prosthetically and biologically to have a predictable aesthetics, I will place my implant. Oh, I recommend for you to place your implant more palatal than at the center of the ridge. We all are familiar with the difference between uh, um, how does the uh, bone stay where it stays based on the Sharpie's fibers um, around the uh, teeth and how it's different between the teeth and the implant. And that's why the probing depth is different between and the implant. The reason, again, to recapture the discussion, you want to create two buckle, uh, two millimeter of buckle bone, uh, and then you want to create a two millimeter of um, soft tissue, and then you want to create the right dimension, diameter, length, and position of the implant. And you don't want to use this design at all where you want the implant platform to be at the bone level, if not slightly below, and you want a concave area from the implant starting 
and you want the ceramic to be half a millimeter to one millimeter below the gingival labially and at the gingival level in the non-aesthetic area. And you want the contact point to be five millimeter below the, or uh, if it's in the maxillary, below the bone level. Now, this also, uh, this article also clarifies the, um, uh, the dimensions that we discussed that the biotype, anything less than two, uh, a gingival thickness of two millimeter is defined as thick biotype and gingival thickness of less than 1.5 is considered thin biotype. And we discussed how you can practically measure it using a probe and uh, believe, um, if uh, you are familiar with uh, uh, documenting all your soft tissue uh, thicknesses at the time of surgery or at the time of diagnosis, I think uh, you can definitely have better uh, uh, predictable aesthetics from now on. Um, these are the articles that talks about those numbers. And we spoke about Tarno and Linde, they are famous for giving us those numbers. So we are wrapping up uh, an ideal implant position in all three dimensions is required. We mentioned what are those three dimensions, missing and available uh, tooth, bone, and soft tissue. During surgery, the emphasis is on proper implant selection to avoid oversized implants. We discussed the, uh, the diameter length and the position how does it affect the soft tissue and the hard tissue and eventually the position of the teeth? Careful and low trauma soft tissue handling and implant placement in a proper position using either a periodontal probe or a prefabricated surgical guide, which we spoke about visualization. If missing the facial bone wall is augmented using a proper surgical technique, such as guided bone regeneration with barrier or membrane and appropriate bone graft and or bone substitute. When we don't have the two millimeters, we create the two millimeters. And finally, precise wound closure. We discussed about the importance of suturing using a submerged or a semi-submerged healing modality is recommended following a healing period of between six and 12 weeks. A reopening procedure is recommended without a punch technique. We totally in the aesthetic zone uh, never allow a punch technique to happen to initiate the restorative phase of therapy. And the top uh, photograph, let me bring it down. So uh, we are definitely uh, very much concerned in the soft tissue on, on the surface of the implant. And we are very careful how to uncover that uh, position and how not to allow that soft tissue to disappear or we cut it away. So how to remove that soft tissue is never using a punch technique. All right, I'm coming to the end of the lecture. These are the people that I refer to. Uh, instead of just putting the article, I'm putting the year, their name, and I'm putting a code, how to remember them. By the time you can look at these uh, authors, I uh, welcome you to uh, start the discussion and let's hear your opinion on what we discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Soil, for the lovely presentation. Friends, uh, you all have close to two minutes to type your questions. Uh, very quickly, I would like to take you through the next presentation, which is going to take place tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Soil, I request you to kindly stop your screen share for a moment. Friends, I request you to kindly post your questions. You, you can type your questions in the question and answer section. Thank you very much, Dr. Sohail. Thank you very much. Friends, this is about the upcoming webinar, which is going to take place tomorrow. The topic is the implant department design and crystal bone loss. If you're interested, you can register for the same and the link can be made available in the chat box. Thank you very much.
All right, friends, with this, we start with the most important topic, rather the session, which is the live question and answer session, starting with the first question. Uh, Dr. Sohail, we have a question from Dr. Manasi from India. Uh, are all procedures uh, differ according to the location of placement of implant or total number of implants placed? Yes, the, this is a multifactorial uh, procedure, which is always there are six elements which have to be considered in any aesthetic uh, restoration uh, or surgical procedure. Because these six elements are interrelated, so every case definitely has its own, uh, you cannot for example, stand, why when we said standardization, we said we talked about the chair. Uh, we know if you're buying a, a specific chair for your uh, eating is different than when you're buying a chair for your comfort because there are standards. And when you go and buy the chair, that's the height, that's the width, that's the... When it comes to implants, even though we have the ideal numbers published and republished, we know them, but when the patient comes to you, they do not have that uh, dimensions to start with. So you need to create those dimensions that you want for predictable aesthetics. So every case is different. We do not have even, we never have a similar case. I don't know if that was an answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Sohil. I hope uh, the question was answered. Moving on to the next question. Uh, thank you for the lovely presentation, Dr. Sohil. You mentioned about the piezo surgery in an, in, in an osteotomy case. Are piezos really re reliable, especially during the COVID-19 era? Which company piezo would you suggest and why? Uh, because uh, we teach implantology since year 2000, we have around 20 years of experience in using different piezo machines i have maybe used five or six of them and uh, what i can tell you is you cannot run a practice without a piezo surgery i mean it doesn't work because if you have a four millimeter of bone you cannot place a four millimeter implant because you will destroy all your four millimeter of bone and according to um Boozer, the best and the maximum amount of bone you need to have predictable aesthetics is two millimeter of bone buccally and two millimeter of bone lingually. So a case which is a disaster because it has only four millimeter of bone, if you use a piezo surgery and you split it in half and you bring two millimeter of buccal bone and two millimeter of lingual bone, you create an ideal position for predictable aesthetics. This is a miracle. So how can you do um, implant surgery without a piezo is impossible. Now, the second question is, which brand you use? Yes. What, uh, what I, uh, uh, I'm not gonna mention a company name, but what I'm gonna mention is your implants generally are longer than 10 millimeters in the aesthetic zone. You like to, because you are not using wide diameter implants. You're using either standard or closer to the narrow diameters. When I say narrow, I'm not talking about mini implants. I'm not talking about the three millimeter implants. I'm talking something 3.3 onward or 3.25 millimeter onward. I say a 3.5 is is something where uh, in many cases we have to do uh, in the aesthetic zones when the bone is not available. Now, even though 3.5 is not the standard size, but it's acceptable in the world of aesthetic area that it can maintain the bone. But with a 3.5, you really do not want to place a 10 millimeter implant. You like to go slightly longer. So if you want to use say an 11.5 to 12 millimeter implant as your average implant in the compromise scenarios, you want the tip of the piezo to be 12 millimeters. 
Unfortunately, 70% of the companies that fabricate piezo surgery uh, machines, they don't pay attention to the height of the tip. They make 10 millimeter tips. So my recommendation, once you have enough power, you try that piezo surgery machine on a piece of uh, um, cortical bone and you see the power is good enough to cut cortical bone. The second thing you want to check is the height of the tip. If you can create a 12 millimeter cut and you have the, the, the strength to cut cortical bone, then that's the piezo surgery I will buy. Thank you very much, doctor. Moving on to the next question. Can the dimensions be same from all sides in any particular situation regarding any particular tooth? Can it be seen or can it be same? Same. In all particular dimensions, can the... I... I, I'll repeat the question, sir. The question is, can the dimensions be same from all sides in any particular situation regarding any particular tooth? No, every um, tooth is a different dimension. And accordingly, we have, again, this uh, six elements is deciding on the dimension of the implant and uh, also the dimension of the the, the best way to answer this question is if you have a wax up and if you can visualize the final restoration, based on that, you will decide the dimension of your implant. So my answer is they are not the same. They can never be the same. Um, but the best way to know what is the difference between this tooth and the other tooth? And how would I know which one to use when? Because that will be the right. I mean, that will be the second question is the final prosthesis. So if you have a wax up which shows what it's like a blueprint of the final prosthesis, based on that, it gives you the uh, criteria to select the right diameter of your implant. Thank you very much, sir. Moving on to the next question. Does concavity and occlusion go hand in hand in anterior aspect? Concavity of where? Of bone or of the lingual? Of... Because not, I spoke about... Not really mentioned, sir. There are three concavities here. One is the bone concavity, which if it's not covered by a thick biotype, I do recommend it to be filled because horizontal uh, augmentations are predictable, especially if it's in a concave area. Uh, in Sibert's classification, they are fantastically explained and it's very easy to uh, uh, augment them and predict the result. So if you have a concavity, no problem. You will not have, uh, 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 I mean, you will not have surprises after 10 years, the bone will remain there. If you use the right procedure and the right bone and the right membrane, you will get predictable results. There is another concavity on the lingual surface of the anterior area, right behind. That concavity is related to the phonetics and it's related to occlusion. So that concavity is very important how you uh, create a proper phonetics for the patient and how you, uh, you give the patient enough uh, aesthetics. So when the patient is smiling, the height is correct, the contact is correct. Uh, that's another con uh, concavity. I'm not sure. Oh, the third concavity, which is important, is something we are pushing the labs to follow, and the doctors are still not getting that, that idea. The, um, the abutment, the part of the abutment, which is subgingival, which is touching the soft tissue. All around that abutment, there should be a concavity. 360 degrees, the lab has to create the concavity because no abutment is sold to you ready-made with that concavity. So it has to be custom-made 
or if you are using a stock abutment, you instruct your lab to make that concave. Once that is concave, you will have a thicker um, soft tissue around it, and you kind of create thick biotite. Those are the three concavities I discussed. Thank you very much, sir. Moving on to the next question. Question from Dr. Rohit. Hi, sir. Any advice on bone augmentation? Well, bone augmentation uh, uh, is a seven uh, uh, lecture series. Each lecture is two hours. So we're looking at 14 hours of discussion on this topic. I'm not sure if you can be more specific on what exactly I can. Otherwise, I need 14 hours to answer bone augmentation. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next question. Question from Dr. Kumar. What's your take on the success rate of PRF along with bone graft for ridge augmentation? Absolutely. Uh, PRGF, PRF, all these uh, um, issues uh, that is being discussed on, they are not very uh, useful. I um, disagree with them. Uh, I'm not saying that PRF is creating bone. I am not saying it creates soft tissue. What I'm saying is the first 11 days where you need the maximum vascularization is that is provided by the PRF. That 11 days, I don't know if this is relevant or not, but I... Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Burj Khalifa in Dubai. At the time of its construction, I was looking at the numbers of the workers. They were uh, in thousands, the people who built it. And after it was built, uh, I started uh, researching how many people are maintaining that building. And they are only 50, five zero from thousands. The reason is when you are building something, you need a lot of people, you need a lot of manpower. But once it's done, you really don't need so many people to maintain it. So for me that 11 days or 12 days, you need the maximum number of cells to come and help the area to start right and start on the right track. Now, there is a, a philosophy that inflammation is a classified into physiologic inflammation and pathological inflammation. Not many of us are familiar with this because in dentistry, we don't study them this way. We study them just inflammation. Now, in simple layman's term and dental term, you can call it chronic inflammation or acute inflammation, even though it's not the same, but for us to be able to at least understand what I'm trying to say, which one you prefer to have, a chronic inflammation or an acute inflammation? I'm sure all of us agree with acute inflammation because it comes quickly and things get done and it disappears. With the, the chronic, it's complicated. So if you can put PRF and you can create an acute physiologic inflammation where all the cells are available, to build that construction that you put in, to build the infrastructure, the vascularization, the blood supply, all the hormones, all the enzymes, all the cells are there. And then after this uh, 10 days or 12 days have passed, okay, there is not much of benefit of the PRF, but that starting point to me is definitely crucial. Thank you, so. Moving on to the next question. Question from Dr. Kasina. So, does uh, buccolingual dimensions of bone required around implant changes ba based on the density of the bone? I mean, in D1 bone, also do we require same amount of 2 millimeter dimensions of bone on uh, buccal and lingual aspect of the implant? Uh, this question has not been addressed uh, by... Uh, because when we talk about the 2 millimeter law, we are talking about the Boozer's article and the people with him. Um, it's not a one person article. There are many people who spoke about this. In that article, he does not go into the difference of the quality of bone. 
So I cannot answer that question from my perspective, but I think in this aspect, quality and quantity definitely uh, play a role. We cannot just say if the quantity is two millimeter and the quality is type four bone, uh, it's exactly the same. But I don't know uh, the exact difference. What I know very uh, surely that 20, uh, two millimeter of any bone is safe for a predictable aesthetics. Now, one millimeter of cortical bone type one versus one millimeter of type four, which one will remodel more? Of course, we all know type four bone will remodel faster if it's exposed to trauma, if it's exposed to any stimulus. So that's logical though. But the good thing is, if you can create two millimeter of bone, any bone, even augmented bone, which is worse than type four bone, you can maintain predictable aesthetics. So the answer to your question is, if you create two millimeter of bone, no matter what, you will have predictable aesthetics. Thank you very much, sir. Moving on to the next question. The question is, how can systematic diseases alter the predictability of aesthetics in implantology? If, well, this question of we becoming doctors is really repeating itself a lot. Uh, I hear this question a lot. Uh, what I uh, basically um, put myself uh, into how much of a doctor's shoes position is becoming less and less. However, I cannot exclude myself from the uh, medical uh, compromises uh, that the patient's disease will affect on my work. So I cannot say I'm not a physician to the patient. Go to your physician, get all your uh, kidney failures done because it will affect this and get your sugar level done and that will affect the 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 um, soft tissue healing, go and get your uh, vitamin D fixed before you come to me because it will affect the density of bone and my um, um, torque values will be altered. My ISQ values will be altered. And I keep putting uh, the patient on a, a position that I am not able to do my work if you are not 100% physically fit. This is definitely um, a dilemma. How much of a physician's role we can take and how much we should not take. So I have limited my interference in becoming a physician to um, diabetes patients. They have to bring us um, um, accumulative, which is HbA1c. Uh, below seven, till then we will not do the procedure and we can recommend the doctors in the country who are capable of putting the patient in that uh, uh, level uh, efficiently and that becomes the diabetic patient. So till they bring that result, or we can take the blood in the clinic and send it and get that result in uh, less than, say, three, four hours. That's the diabetes. That's how much I get involved. Anything below uh, seven, I get involved. Anything above, I just refer them. The second thing is a vitamin D. Uh, we do not like to treat patients which are uh, 30 nanogram uh, below. So if they are between zero and 10, we definitely refer them to a physician. And if, we are, if they are between 10 and 20, we give them uh, a regimen how to improve their uh, vitamin D level. And if they are from 20 to 30 is another regimen. And if they are 30 plus, we just uh, do not uh, um, bother about vitamin D. So anything beyond these two, we generally... Uh, if they are on medication, we generally send them back to their uh, physician 
to take care of that before they come to us or we discuss with their physician how the patient will tolerate. For example, they are on steroid. For example, they are uh, heart patients. They have a valve. They are because we do treat patients with cancer. We do treat patients who are on medication of um, uh, when they have uh, arthro, uh, they have bone diseases. I'm looking for that medicine that they take. It doesn't come to my mind now. Uh, we do treat patients who smoke uh, uh, less than 10 cigarettes a day. So we do have uh, uh, a list of yes and no, but we are not the physicians of that case. So without the discussion with the physician of the patient, and if they don't have one, they should get one, we will not proceed if the patient is compromised. Thank you, sir. Moving to the next question. Question from Dr. Aparna. I've read about zirconia implants that are placed in the anterior region for aesthetic purpose. What's your take on zirconia implants in the anterior region? All right. This is a, I'm going to answer this religiously. Can you repeat the patient's, uh, the doctor's name? Sure, sir. Dr. Aparna. Aparna. So I, I guess uh, religiously, um, she will be a Hindu. And uh, my religion, I'm a Baha'i, and we have Christians listening to this, and we have Muslims listening to this, and we have Jews listening to this, and we have Zoroastrians listening to this conversation. See, in my opinion, every religion is respected. And if I start saying bad things about different religions, it's disrespected to the other religion because I don't know. When it comes to zirconium implants, even though I really don't, uh, because I have removed many zirconium implants in my practice and replaced them with titanium implants, I am not going to be the follower of zirconium implants till I see something really different than what I've seen in the early days. But who am I to say, don't use them? If you come to our institute and you take one year or two years of uh, learning, in our institute, we are against using zirconium implants today. Maybe I don't know enough to say this, or maybe in the future they will have more publications. Maybe they have a higher success rate. Maybe they will change some of their modalities. I don't know. But I cannot say zirconium implant is a bad implant. My experience, I am not going to use zirconium implants because I don't have enough knowledge, experience, and frankly speaking, uh, I don't recommend it because of my ignorance. So I leave it at that. Thank you so much, sir. Moving to the next question. Question from Dr. Simran Dhawan. What is the impact of implant inclination on the stress distribution of mandibular prosthetic restorations? Yeah, this is a this debate was solved uh, in. Uh, I'm trying to remember Paolo Maolo's research. It was 2000, and I I don't remember the year, but you can Google Paolo Maolo. He's a very famous uh, author, and he invented the all in four, and uh, he has 97% uh, plus success rate of 10 years follow-up cases. He proved to us that before him, before Paolo Maolo, we thought uh, the inclination was negatively affecting uh, the bone resorption, and it was creating uh, problems. And unfortunately, all that information was wrong. So implant placed in an angle. I have placed implants at 65 degrees angle, 65 degrees. And I have more than five years of follow up on that case. You might say, why you placed the implant? Are you crazy or what? The, the answer to that is the sinus of this patient was all the way to the lateral incisor. Imagine the size of the sinus. 
So uh, we were doing immediate loading of full mouth reconstruction, and I had to give the patient a restoration at the day of surgery. Uh, so I had to place my implants in different uh, angles. And following Paolo Maolo's research, what happens in the parental ligaments with natural dentition, when they are angulated, they get worse because of the occlusal trauma or trauma from occlusion. That law does not apply to the implants because they don't have a periodontal ligament. So to answer your question, I think all that information that we learned was wrong. There is no impact on angulation, on bone resorption, or soft tissue um, uh, recession. So to me, angulated or not angulated, it does not affect. Thank you, sir. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't affect negatively. Sorry, go ahead. No problem, sir. Moving on to the next question. Uh, sir, do I have your permission to ask you a few more questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next question. Question from Dr. Rohit. Is the perforating cancellous or cortical bone mandatory to augment bone? Depends on... Uh... Depends on uh, the envelope of bone around it. Uh, the, this question has to be drawn to answer, but I will try to say it verbally. If the neighboring bone is already, uh, if this perforation is within the envelope of bone and the perforation is small, no, you don't have to. But if there's a depression in that perforation, yes, you have to augment bone because the soft tissue will travel. Remember, always there is a race. What was the name of the doctor who asked the question? Uh, just a second, sir. Dr. Rohit. Dr. Rohit, I don't know if you are into racing or not, but I'm sure you have raced in, when you were in school or college. Remember, there is always a race between three cells whenever you have a perforation. Three, people are racing to fill that perforation. The epithelial cells, the connective tissue cells, and the bone cells. And the slowest one is the bone cells. The fastest ones are the epithelial cells. The second fastest are the connective tissue cells. So if you're worried that the epithelial cells, because of the size of your perforation, are going to win, then fill it up and put a membrane. If you think they are, the perforation is not that big of a deal, then leave it. Because if, even if the epithelial cells get there first, fine, because it's such a small amount, they're going, not going to affect your osseointegration. And if you are somewhere in between, you're not sure, at least put a membrane so you stop the epithelial and connective tissue there, uh, cells to go there, and you will not get bone there, but at least the clot which will form will seal that uh, hole with um, uh, osteoblast eventually in six months. So I think uh, depends on the size of your perforation. But remember the race. There is a race. Next. Thank you, sir. Moving to the next question. Question from Dr. Sita Ram. Sir, can you please comment on better bone grafting material? Is it allograft or alloplast? Again, this is a 14-hour lecture. Uh, it's not a question of better or worst. I have uh, three kids. Which one of them is better? It doesn't make sense to ask that question. Each one has some qualities. You go to a garden full of flowers. Which flower is better? There is no such thing. For every occasion, for every required augmentation, there is a requirement for a bone material. And that's why they were created. And that's why they were invented. That's why they were... Uh, uh, published upon. 
So you have to understand uh, the resorption rate of each of them. And again, uh, you have to understand the size of the defect. What you want that defect to be? Is that defect touching the implant? Probably if it's touching the implant, you need a different type of bone material. If it's not touching the implant and it's only uh, to keep the width of the bone for many years, maybe you need another type of uh, non-resorbing bone or slow resorbing bone. So the answer to that question is, it is dependent on the need of that augmented area. So for example, if you're in the sinus, it doesn't matter what you use because eventually any space will be filled or transformed into bone. But if you are talking about a gap between um, an implant and the buccal bone, where in Khan's um, article we saw in class one, probably you want a bone which is remodeling quickly. So you want to go with um, um, uh, human bone, or either it's from the same patient or from another patient. So um, it's very, very uh, dependent on where and the quantity and the size. The bigger the size, you have to think of the cells or you have to think of the PRF. You have to think of how to bring uh, the blood supply to the area. Otherwise, you're going to get um, only 38% 38, uh, 38 of that bone is going to remain if you are not thinking of the blood supply and you're going to lose something close to 60% of that bone is going to be resorbed if you are not paying attention. In most of the articles, they show a 60% resorption if you're not careful. So um, the answer to the question again is um, it's multifactorial. Thank you, sir. Moving to the next question. Question from Dr. Kasina. Tem uh, tempor temporary restorations should be left for how long in patient Three to months. achieve better soft tissue contacts? Three months is more than enough for soft tissue maturation, according to Bilzer. And Thank there you. is one more author for the soft tissue. It's called GEMT. Uh, GEMT also speaks about provisionalization. And the maximum time you need for soft tissue maturation is three months. Thank you, sir. Moving to the next question. Can the membrane be stabilized using cover screw of an implant? This is a tricky uh, procedure because if the bone is not deep enough and the cover screw is not deep enough, when I say the bone, I mean the difference between the soft tissue and the bone. De depends how safe you are in making sure that membrane doesn't get exposed. If you are sure that membrane is not getting exposed, you go ahead and do it. But if it gets exposed, you have to open the cover screw to remove the infected membrane. By doing so, if you loosen the entire implant and the whole implant comes out, was it worth the risk? To me, it's not worth the risk. So I don't do this. I've done it uh, and I regret that I did it. So I don't do it. Some companies are recommending a cover screw on top of another cover screw, and they are making it into two layers. Uh, those are all, uh, to me, just embed it and find different ways of stabilizing, stabilizing it. If you are not comfortable in using tags, there are resorbable tags, there are titanium tags, because it's not very, um, easy and you have to buy the equipment and it's uh, you have to make a small hole in the bone it's not a very quick procedure to do tax on membranes and sometimes the area is small is not worth it you should practice doing deep mattress sutures learn go to any article even youtube is helpful uh, practice deep mattress suture so you you suture the membrane in place and then once that is stable then you suture the soft tissue on top that keeps the membrane intact and you don't need to 
connected to the cover screw of the implant. Thank you, sir. Moving to the next question. Question from Dr. Can I, can I know how many questions are left? Uh, so we do have a couple of questions more. Go ahead. Uh, Go yeah, ahead. If you, Go ahead. maybe if you want, maybe we can. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, it's great. Thank you very much, sir. Moving on to the next question. Question from Dr. Leela. I have been using short implants. Uh, will the numbers and calculations that you showed in your presentation be also applied for short implants, which are five millimeters to eight millimeters? See, if you are, again, we go back to this religion concept. All what we discussed is relative to the non-Bicon family implants. If you are dealing with the Bicon family, it's a different religion. The principles are different. The way they pray is different. The, the way they, they treat the bone is different. The way they drill is different. The speed is different. Everything they do is different. So if you are doing a Bicon family implant, uh, you have to follow their principles. And you cannot mix and match some laws from these principles to the laws of another system, not system. It's a totally a different philosophy. It's like zirconium implant versus titanium implant. They have totally different philosophies. So if you are doing with uh, usual implant, the, I mean, the ones I don't want to term, use the term usual, the, the customary implants that I showed, uh, uh, short implants are predictable, but with lesser publication on them. So I would say that as you experience yourself, you will uh, place more number of implants when it comes to shorter implants. For example, a four unit bridge with two implants on a standard length implant is very predictable up to, we have our data is more than 20 years. We are still maintaining those cases. With shorter implants, in our work, we have uh, better success when they are multiple in number. If they are standing on their own, they are just keeping their own crown on top. And if they are in a bridge, there are more than, uh, say, a four unit bridge, we will place maybe three implants, if not four individual single crowns on four implants. So the only difference I would do is to place more implants for two reasons. One is to switch your success rate to at least survival when one of the implant fails. What does that mean? It means if, if you have a four unit bridge and you have say three or four implants, each one is holding its own crown, individual crowns, or you have a four unit bridge with three implants instead of two. If you lose one implant, still you can use your four unit bridge. So the, for the patient, this is a survival. For you, it's a survival because you don't have to do anything else. Just remove the implant and send the patient home. But if you place only two implants and you did a four unit bridge with a short um, implant, then it's considered a failure because the patient needs another surgery. The patient needs another restoration. So actually your plan failed. So the difference between failure, success and survival is you do a plan from the beginning. If you lose an implant, still the case survives. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Moving to the next question. Does the surface coating on the implant really matters, especially when it comes to go good bone remodeling? Depends on what, what, uh, what treatment. Uh, the HA treatment for many years, it was causing uh, problems because it was detaching from the surface. If you're talking about which, which surface treatment, of course, machine surfaces are totally out of question. 
we have uh, laser treatment to engineer the surface of the implant uh, in a way that the cells can be attracted, different cells can be attracted to different parts of the implant. Uh, at the moment, as we speak, there is a lot of research in, uh, um, in my university in New Jersey about how to treat the surface to have more predictable results in terms of osseointegration. Uh, I'm sure the future will have better surface treatments for better predictability. Uh, however, the simplest format, which I can tell you is the, the SLA format is um, uh, definitely successful. The, uh, the other formats where they blast the surface with salt, uh, for example, calcium, they are also successful. The laser treatment uh, is uh, successful. Uh, the, the only um, controversial uh, treatments are the HA coating and some of the, uh, the ionic uh, uh, treatment, which will, they place the implant in an ionic solution and they put titanium on the other end and they create um, different topography. If it's not done very well in some companies, they have higher failure rate than in other companies. So I think even in those surfaces, they might call them the same, but when the quality control is low, um, the name of the procedure of the of the way they treat the surface could be the same, but the quality could be different. So again, um, it should be done properly if they are doing surface treatment. Thank you very much, sir. Moving to the next question. Question from Dr. Akshay. Many implant companies are claiming about the no bone loss concept in implantology. There is also a stress in the implant abatement connection. What is your point of view on this subject? Well, uh, the, the, the implant or a piece of metal in the mouth cannot dictate uh, the human genetic of body uh, when it comes to bone remodeling. That means if I take my finger and I press it against Dr. Akshay's forehead for, say, uh, one year, I just put my finger against his forehead for one year. And he tells me there is no bone remodeling happening to his forehead. I will disagree because bone remodeling is a genetic procedure and it has to happen. You cannot place a piece of foreign body in, in my bone and say, uh, I have stopped bone remodeling because of my implant system is better than others. But the question is, how much of a bone remodeling is clinically significant? What do I mean by clinically significant? If that bone remodeling is not affecting the final result of my restoration, my aesthetics, the soft tissue, the bone, after the bo bone remodeling is completed, or at least it's in a phase of maintenance, then fine, bone remodeling happened, but the, I did not lose that much bone, which will affect it. I, I probably lost 0 0.01 millimeter of bone. And then after some time, because of the occlusal pressure, I regained that bone or the structure of the bone in the beginning, it became oven bone, and then slowly it went back to mature bone. For whatever reason, the bone remodeling happened in a way that it didn't affect my results on the long run clinically, then fine, let me have that implant system. But to tell me there is no bone remodeling, uh, that's not possible. Now, geometry, as I showed you in my lecture, plays a role in uh, soft and hard tissue um, uh, formation. So the more you allow the soft tissue to grow in a space, it will grow. So if you can fabricate your prosthetics, your uh, abutment in the shape and the morphology uh, that allows the soft tissue to get closer to it uh, and become thicker at that area, 
of course, it will positively affect your restoration. Thank you, sir. Coming up with the last question, question from Dr. Vishwas. Considering partial extraction therapies like socket shield coming up, do you recommend them over conventional immediate implants in most cases or specific ones only? Well, uh, immediate placement doesn't contradict uh, buccal shield. I don't know why he said either this or that. Actually, it can be done combined. And normally it is actually done combined. Uh, regarding this uh, uh, buccal shield, even though for people who do it on a regular basis, it's uh, very straightforward and simple. And the way you look at uh, um, the videos available and the lectures, you think it's, um, it's very, very uh, simple. Yeah, I even have the kit from uh, a company which uh, makes it simpler. But for me, because of my experience, 50% uh, of the cases that I do, I uh, cannot do it the way that it should be done. Other 50%, I get them perfectly the way I want. So if you are planning to do them, keep in mind, there will be a learning curve for you. So you should allot an extra hour in the beginning for all your cases. So don't book cases. For example, if you put a 45 minute per implant placement, for that case, you should put one hour and 45 minutes for the first few cases till you are very comfortable. Because if you are in hurry, the, the damage you create is more than if you did not do it to begin with. If you just extracted the tooth straightforward, do the procedure based on experience, you pack the bone between the uh, implant and the buckle according to Kahn's classification. If you have type one, you're done, fine. The procedure is done, 45 minutes over, your next patient is on the chair, happily ever after, predictable results. But if you are not uh, calm and you do this very slowly, very slowly, and you break the buccal bone, or after one hour of work, this uh, small piece of tooth actually falls into your hands because you are in a hurry, or you used vibration, you didn't use all the equipment which is recommended, because you should not use the regular handpiece and the regular uh, 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 vibration that the drill will create. You have to be precise in what to use and what not to use. So if you do it right, I think uh, the future definitely is in favor of keeping the buckle bone in the same position. I'm not only talking about the anterior, even the posterior area, uh, it's very nice to be able to have that skill in your practice. And uh, you should be proud to have that skill uh, um, um, performed in all your cases. That is the ultimate goal if you can do it on all your cases. But keep in mind, it's a long road. Thank you, doctor. Well, with this, we come to an end of this beautiful question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Soel, on behalf of Team Dentist Channel Online, it's my privilege to thank you for the lovely presentation and for answering to the lovely questions and for answering them so very briefly. Uh, friends, with this, we come to an end. Thank you so much for participating. It was so nice to have each and every one of you patiently waiting till the end of the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Soel, once again. Thank you so You're much, welcome. friends. Thank you very much.